Hello, welcome to Flying High with Flutter. I'm your host, Alan Wyman, and today I have Norbert. Uh, sorry, I forgot your last name. You only put Norbert in, 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 your, in your name on here. So uh, he is a college student who is focusing quite a bit of his free time on Flutter and making some interesting apps. Um, yeah, why don't you uh, give us your full name? And I'm, I hope it's not a very complicated German name, right? Uh, no, it's actually a Hungarian name. It's kind of hard to pronounce for most people. Um, it's Kozia. Um, I don't know if it's uh, really pronounceable in English. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Norbert. I'm a college student or here in Europe, it's a university student. Um, I've, I've been using for Flutter, Flutter for about three years and I've always done crazy experiments and focused my university time more on doing Flutter stuff than university itself, I feel like. Um, yeah. So what actually brought you to Flutter, right? Because you're still in school, you're not like developing apps professionally. Um, so before I found Flutter, um, I've been playing around with Android and also actually had a job as an Android uh, developer. It was right at the beginning of when I started university. So back in school, even I um, kind of stumbled upon Java and had fun like making small games. And then I kind of got into Android because it was also obviously using Java. And from there on, um, yeah, I've been doing apps in Android. And at some point I just by sheer accident found this video of a Dart conference where they were talking about Flutter. Um, at first I completely dismissed it and I was like, okay, I don't want to watch this video now. Like day after I was like, hmm, what was that? I remember hearing something about cross-platform and mobile apps, uh, maybe worth uh, taking a look. So I did, uh, it looked cool. I had a small project at the time, which was um, a bookshelf app. Um, I was reading quite a lot in that time. So I built a small app in Android where you could keep track of your books and I wanted to make it like nice and graphical. So I thought, okay, I have this little project which I've been doing in my free time. Can I do it in Flutter? And fair enough, I was able to finish like a very basic app in a weekend without any prior experiences in Flutter. Obviously I had quite a bit of Android experience so I knew how to like do certain things. Um, and yeah, that, that's how I pretty much got started. Um, and yeah, it was super fast. I decided to write an article, um, where I talked about like my experience and like the small app I built in, in a day essentially. And yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> well, your history is still being created, right? You're still quite young in your career. Are you actually going to school for programming or are you studying something else? Yeah, I'm, um, university for computer science. Um, currently finishing up um, all of it, writing my bachelor's thesis, um, which if everything goes well is uh, done this year and I will be done with university next year. Um, yeah, that's the plan. So you actually have to write a thesis for computer science? Because for, for us, we just had to write a program. So that's, that's interesting. Oh. Yeah, that I think cool. we're, we're too lucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be cool. So uh, I don't think there is really a a university degree where you don't have to write a thesis. And most of the time, like it always has to be very theory based. Like there are certain um, areas where it can be more practical, where you also write software, but there's always going to be like just sitting down, writing something scientific. Um, I think that's like part of pretty much every university degree here in Germany, at least. Yeah, I think out here they are in Hong Kong too, they also just have something called the FYP, founding your project, where you just create some kind of project. I think sometimes, maybe not all of them, you actually have to, you can, um, you have to like write some documents with it, write some kind of thesis, but I, I can't quite remember. Um, but, but yeah, anyways, I mean, to me, like, yeah. I think writing a program is much better. I, I really hate writing papers. I'm so horrible with that. And uh, it's much more interesting, right? Because, yeah, that's what you're going to be doing when you, most of the time when you got a computer science, unless you're really in out there, right? Like if you're really uh, like a scientist in the end for computers, but that's a very low percentage of people, I think. Um, what, what brought you into computer science to begin with? Um, so that's has been like a thing I pretty much knew for a long time. So 
before, so actually, okay, before I uh, got interested in computer science, I was really into visual effects and like all the Hollywood things you see, the explosions and all that stuff. So when I was very little, I played around with anything I could do with, with visual effects. Um, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but I kind of stumbled upon programming. So I did a bit of programming before that too, like something very basic, just dabbling around as a kid. And eventually it got more serious. And like in school, I built games I built. So in, your, uh, in school, we had to do like three big kind of presentations thingies, which uh, counted as a, uh, as a kind of big part of your, um, of your, uh, of your assignment, whatever. And I actually did all of those three related to computer science. Uh, for all of them, I programmed something and I combined it with something else. So, um, at that point, me and everybody around me kind of knew, okay, after I'm done with school, I'm going to start studying computer science. So I, I'd say I was lucky knowing so early that I wanted to do that because um, it can be really hard to actually figure out what to do after school. But like really for me, it was always pretty clear. So no regrets? You still still ready to, to keep going on this way? Because lots of students end up changing their majors. I actually knew a guy who went from computer science to being uh, pre-med, <laughs> which you don't hear so often. Um, so yeah, studying computer science, um, also at my university, um, is really hard, so it's not easy. Um, and to be honest, like most of it is not actually computer science. So a lot of it is like math, um, is like, uh, just studying things you will literally forget a week after. Um, so it's hard, but I never really thought about switching. So, um, yeah, still going strong. Um, Studying, so I've been taking my time, uh, let's say that. So I could have been finished earlier, but I kind of always was more focused on the practical side because, um, as you said before, university more, it helps you more to become a scientist, to learn scientific research, writing, and all of this. But I feel like it doesn't really prepare you too much to your everyday job programming. Um, but it's still very, very nice to learn all those theoretical things, which kind of expand your horizon because you kind of see what different areas there are. If there is like a concept you learn at university and you're like at a very difficult problem and you're like, oh, I remember this problem is probably NP complete. I know I can't find an algorithm which does this very well. And because you have like knowledge in a lot of different areas, you kind of you kind of select what you want to dive into deeper yourself. Obviously, if you know you want to build apps, you don't need a university degree. Like you could learn everything you need for apps without a university degree in just a tiny fraction of the time. So have you found that like your, I mean, obviously some things in your school, but I mean like more of like the things that you think, you know, when, when would I ever need this? And then like it actually came up in your programming, like when you're programming by yourself where you're like, Oh, actually, yeah, this is quite useful. Or like when you're doing things practical and you go back to your schoolwork and you're like, Oh, I know this one because I saw this in my free time. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to find a concrete, like, a, an example for this, but definitely like there has been a lot of times where it's like just a concept you, you learn from, let's say university. Um, one very interesting, um, lecture we had was, Pro, um, programming paradigms, um, which basically cover different paradigms of programming. So there is your object oriented programming, which Dart, Java is very much uh, based on. But there is also functional programming, which uh, more and more is embraced by all the modern languages. But there's also completely funky and different things like uh, logical programming. Uh, logical programming, where, um, for example, um, language is called um, Prolog. Um, and it's basically a language you can write apps, you can pretty much do anything with it. Obviously, there's no real frameworks for it. So in theory, you could do all of it. And it's not based on functions or objects, it's based on facts. So to write a program, you write down facts. And stuff like this has been very interesting to kind of look um, on how one could approach things differently just because like you're not confined by the paradigm you're currently using. You can take a look at, let's say something different. See, okay, that would make sense in this case. Let's, let's try using this. 
And I mean, also like math is, is hard, um, but sometimes it can, for some algorithms, it can really help you to, um, when I was doing like I, in my free time, I did uh, work on a couple of hobby fun game projects where there was actually quite a bit of math involved by calculating velocities, collisions and whatnot. So knowing how to do certain things in a efficient and easy manner is certainly very, very good to know. But again, you could learn this all if you need it in your free time. So university is more like, here is everything we got. Maybe you can do something with it. Whereas if you do it on yourself, it's like, okay, what do I need? Where can I learn it? It's interesting that you that you took a look at Prologue, right? Because uh, that's got a lot of inspiration to uh, Erlang. Mm-hmm. And Erlang, I believe, inspired some pieces in, in Dart with the idea of isolates. Oh, uh, really? Have you done some Erlang before or no? No, I haven't. Since you, since you know Prologue, if you look at Erlang, you'll be like, okay, I, I understand this stuff. To me, I tried to read it. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of like commas here, but mm-hmm. periods go over here and... Uh, I think there's like a, a skinny arrow syntax, and it's really quite weird. It's it's really like one of the few functional programming languages that actually gets used in production. Like Haskell, people like to look at Erlang a lot and, and know about it because Haskell is, is also a functional programming language, but it's a more academic, right? Not a lot of people using it in production in comparison. That's true. So I had a long discussion with um, – what's his – sorry, I forgot his name uh, – Lund, uh, can't remember, Casper Lund, hmm. one of the creators of Dart, and he was saying, yeah, yeah, I, I love Erlang. Uh, the idea of isolates really, I think he said the idea of isolates actually came from that idea where you, you don't actually share share memory, you just use message passing to act, act a pattern to get through everything. Yeah, it's also super interesting how like everything that is kind of modern now in all the modern languages is kind of based on very old concepts. So it really goes the way that there is some um, scientific work being done in an area and that has to be very fundamentally correct and very thoroughly tested before I can actually move into uh, into a productive environment where it has to work in all cases. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at where all of this comes from and how it kind of evolved and it's also again interesting to see all the modern concepts actually be based in like super old languages and there's i I, th- I, th- I still think there's a lot of concepts which are kind of hidden in the in the old um that probably will see the light of the day and kind of make it to more and more languages too if i remember correctly i think immutable data is also kind of an old idea that's kind of resurfacing um i mean the idea of how to properly handle data uh concurrently and, and parallel is like it's a really old concept, but the problem is like we never had CPUs that could actually crunch data like at the same time, you know, like multiple CPU cores. Is, mm-hmm. We've had multiple CPUs, but never really multiple CPU cores, right? So, but this problem's kind of been solved. And like you said, people are kind of going back and saying, what did they do when we had multiple CPUs, but not multiple CPU cores? Because it's the same idea, right? Yeah. Uh, how, do, how do we handle this kind of issue? And yeah, people have kind of solved it, right? There's more than one to do it. Locks, mutexes, and then an actor pattern. Uh, yeah, it's it, yeah, I agree. It's super interesting. Um, yeah, and also talking about your idea about kind of like going to academics and finding ideas. I believe somebody else was talking about that in another podcast, not, not on this podcast, but another podcast. And they're saying like, yeah, that they they actually reach into like recent findings in academics and try to experiment and see if it actually works. Or they, they test it out and like maybe crash and burns and then like the scientists or whoever was working out were like, really, how did it go? Oh, so badly, huh? Maybe I can come up with an idea for that. But yeah, like you said, I think ML or, or machine learning and this kind of thing are really looking at what is these companies doing and how they're applying concepts and, and do we need to tweak our things? So of course on paper they look good, but in the real world, do they actually work? Right, is what you're basically saying. True. Yeah. So have you ever have you been doing that too, where you learn something and you try to route in real life? You're like, this doesn't work at all. What are, what about why are they teaching us this stuff? <laughs> um, I'd say probably. So I cannot recall something specific, but yeah, probably. Um, 
I mean, it's it's always like that. In theory, everything looks like good. Okay, yeah, that that seems to work. Yeah, sounds reasonable. And in practice, you are like, I don't know why, but this just doesn't work. <laughs> so I'm sure there was moments like this. I've seen a few times where people are like, yeah, I don't need to use a library. I can write this thing myself in five minutes, and then they write it in longer time, but more bugs than any other open source library out there. Yeah, like the devil lies in the detail. I feel like making making something which is which functions for something very specific is in comparison easy, but making something that works generally for a lot of different cases and a lot of different like yeah use cases that's where the real challenge is because the the different possibilities is just so big like i'd say the problems rise exponentially with every new user you get because um, there could be so many problems that arise so the more niche and specific it is the easier it is to actually uh to build um all right so we, we went through kind of your background uh you are working part-time i believe right are you allowed to to give any kind of details about what you're doing part-time or um yeah a bit so um i'm working part-time at this company where i'm currently working on a floor project so a actually it's not a dev tool but it is uh, a project for flutter um i cannot give uh too many details just yet because it's not finished um but I hope I will be able to talk about more about it more in the future. Okay. How did you manage to find that that position, or did they find you? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, it, it's funny. It, basically, I got a message on Twitter, and that's how it all started. Now, did you dismiss it off off the top of your of your thing? You're like, what what is this? And who who offers me jobs on Twitter? This this has got to be a scam. Um, I mean, I I think Twitter is a it's kind of a great place to, to connect to people and why not also use it to like find people to, to work together with. So um, I cannot recall exactly what happened, but I mean, we talked, uh, it was interesting and we came to an agreement eventually. And yeah, I mean, Twitter is a great place um, yeah, to, connect, to pe- uh, connect with people in general. So why not? Makes sense. Uh, I know I had somebody find me on LinkedIn and I was like, this is this, this, maybe this is a scam or something because the guy, it was like a CIO of some MNC adding me saying, we're looking for, for help with Flutter. Uh, can you, can you help us out? That's, that seems really weird. Why would you do that? But it was real, right? It's actually a current client of mine. And um, of course I, I don't, I don't mind. You can connect with me on whatever. If you have something I can help you with, but, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Usually it's a more formal email or something, right? Whenever somebody kind of reaches out, that's why I'm not used to that. Uh, people saying, "Hey, you know, I need your help on Twitter," and then uh, connect with me, and I got work for you, right? It, it feel, it's still too new for me. Maybe I'm too old. <laughs> You're obviously younger than me. That's true. Yeah, I don't know. Like, just just being informal sometimes I feel can help in a world where pretty much everything is formal, and you have to do forums and I don't know, interviews and rounds and whatever. So just, just kind of like, if you have something in common and if it just makes sense, um, why not just, just talk to the person? Because in the end, it's just people. It's not like, uh, it's a robot sitting on your end of the Twitter account that is only parsing valid formal messages. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I mean, the main reason we brought you here is because you you created this really interesting, cool doll called Detective. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do want to say, of course, thank you again. Like we had a discussion and a Google Meet call uh, at least a week ago or last week, was it? I think. Yeah. Two weeks up. ago. Definitely recently. I could let's say that. And I do appreciate your time. Um, yeah, it, it, you also caught me at a very busy moment. So I apologize. I was a little bit busy then. Um, but no, I did appreciate your, your tool, right? And it gave me some ideas and I also gave you some ideas, which I think could be good, but that depends on your time and everything else. Um, but why, why don't you kind of talk more about it and uh, let people know exactly what it is? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, detective is this project. I, uh, essentially started last year in December. Um, it really just started out me finding by pure luck, this package called VM services, um, which I was very intrigued with because it basically allows you to control and connect to the application in a way that I didn't think was possible. 
Um, so I just kind of took a look at the package and went for a walk and thought like, okay, this is cool. There definitely is something in here that could be made possible by this. So I just walked around and kind of thought, okay, what could be something that this would make sense with? And that's basically how Detective Cut started. So it was this fun experimental project, which pretty much all my projects start out as is just experimenting with something cool. Um, and it eventually grew to something more than just being experimental. Um, yeah, I always wanted to build something that also is kind of sustainable because I've done a lot of open source work before and um, also had a lot of projects that I started and realized at some point nobody really needed it and stopped. So I wanted to build something that is actually sustainable in a way that um, I can really spend the time on this um, knowing that it's not time, it's not time I don't spend on something better. Um, so yeah, I, I first built a free version, which is still free, which allows you to take a look at stuff. I thought, um, um, a couple of features that are, I'd say more advanced and maybe not everybody needs, but some people could very much benefit from it could be behind a pro version. Um, but yeah. I, what, what Detective essentially does is using this VM services package, um, it allows you to observe and control your application without having to stop inside the application. So using breakpoints, you have to pause the application. When it is paused, you can take a look at variables, you can invoke things, you can evaluate expressions. Um, but the issue I had with this is it's always hard. So when a program is stopped, you have access to the surrounding context. So let's say you stop inside your business logic component so you can take a look what's going on in there. But for example, what if you want to know what is going on somewhere else? So now you kind of have to, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not really possible to get a bigger picture of what your app is currently doing. Also, you know what? the state is in that current point, but you don't really know how that state is changing, how often it is changing, how rapidly it is. So it's really hard to get a um, kind of a timed understanding of how your app is behaving, what leads to what, how is stuff interacting with each other. So that's basically what I did with Detective. It allows you to take a look at your application changing in real time. So you're building your feature and you have some sort of state, you have a block, you have a Redux store, and you just want to make sure something is behaving correctly. If you tap a button, this variable is being set. Um, or if you're in error state and you want to know this, this, and this component, what are the states for these? Oh, I see there is an error or there is something wrong. So you can just quickly get kind of an overview of what is going on. Um, and that's like the core functionality of Detective. And on top of that, it also has in the pro version, the ability to invoke functions. For example, you have a class where you have a bunch of functions, which um, change data, which fill out forms, which communicate with the API. So sometimes if you start working on logic first and build the UI later, you kind of end up with this temporary UI, which kind of triggers stuff so you can test. So the, the, the idea behind this one use case at least was, okay, you could use Detective to just call this function without having to build the UI yourself. Or you could have your app running and just call this function without having to stop the app, without having to pause everything and just kind of quickly change and interact with, with the app without having to like navigate into some sort of small menu inside your app. So basically it kind of tries to speed everything up. Everything is already possible, but it may be cumbersome. It may be, um, may take some time. It may involve a lot of navigating and tapping. So Detective kind of tries to give you a shortcut to that. Now for Detective, right? This only can work if you're in debug mode, right? You cannot do this in release mode or am I wrong? Yes. Um, so you can only do this in debug mode and that makes a lot of sense because, um, Debug and release mode are essentially completely different. So basically what is happening, debug mode, it adds a lot of debugging capabilities to your app, which also make it slower, which also make it, um, yeah, mainly slower. But again, you wouldn't want some sort of 
debugging capability and release app because you don't want other people to debug your app. Um, so basically in debug mode, um, besides different compilation and all of this, um, the VM services is included. Um, basically, it's code running inside your application, which you don't have to touch, which you don't even have to know about, um, which essentially all of this, it opens a server inside the app, um, more specifically a WebSocket, and it allows outside parties to connect to that app and, for example, get analytics data, for example, what kind of properties different widgets have. It allows you to, to um, for example, the widget inspector heavily uses the VM services to allow you to select a widget, to, to show the widget tree, to toggle the layout borders, to um, enable slow animations. All it does is kind of connect to the app using this WebSocket and just dispatch commands to that. And in there, um, inside the Flutter framework, for example, for the layout borders, it's implemented in there and all it does is switch it, is, switches it on and off. The cool thing is this VM service also includes stuff like evaluating an object, calling an object, evaluating code. So essentially it allows you to take a look at the memory with a very high level API. So basically if I have an ID to an object and an ID is like an internal thing inside your application, which you have, don't have to, to know about. So if you have an handle to object, object, you can kind of evaluate it over and over again. And that's exactly what Detective is doing. So to achieve this real-time update, every time you tell Detective, I want to observe this object, it figures out its internal ID, saves it, and refreshes that ID every second to, uh, to see, okay, what changed. And this kind of um, makes it so it looks real time. It not, it's not completely real time. So if you have a variable changing very, very rapidly, like hundreds of times a second, you won't fully see that because it's just refreshing once, once a second. But for most practical purposes, that's, that's fully, um, fully fine. So when you work with this WebSocket, that's the same WebSocket I would see when I just click to turn on my app and then I see a little WebSocket connection. Is that the same WebSocket? It should be the same WebSocket. So for Detective to, to connect, you pass this VM service out parameter, um, which is as far as I know, I did a bit of research uh, to, to see if I can remove that and kind of connect to it in another way without having to add this argument. But that's like a way to just print this this uh, endpoint to, to a file, which I can then read and um, connect to the same thing. But yeah, so basically the Dart VM observatory and all of that is all connecting to this WebSocket and providing you performance uh, statistics. It's providing you, yeah, everything you are used to setting breakpoints. So even the, the IDEs use this. So for example, um, IntelliJ and VS Code, to set a breakpoint, basically you tell the VM service, I want to set a breakpoint at this point. And yeah, so with Detective, it, it, I don't have practical reasons for it right now, but I could be setting, removing, changing breakpoints from Detective without you having to tap it on it in, for example, IntelliJ. I must wonder if like, you could take some of Detective and actually build it directly into like the, uh, not the debugger, but just like within IntelliJ. I know that you do have an IntelliJ plugin, but I think it's a, there's some niceties to it, but I think it's also kind of more so just a way to plug into Detective rather than like building in Detective's functionalities into the plugin, right? Yeah. So there's a couple of ways I could approach this. And again, it kind of depends on what is needed. And again, also this, also like the usage, like a lot of people use Detective and all, they all say, this is cool, but they really, really need this inside IntelliJ. Um, then it's maybe because it takes time. So there's two approaches. One would be to use Flutter Web to compile Detective and put that web app inside of WebView inside, inside of IntelliJ. And that's essentially what the new Flutter Inspector is doing. The new Flutter Inspector is written in Flutter for web inside IntelliJ. Um, so Detective could in theory live inside it in IntelliJ inside like a tab or something. Or what I could also do is like put the functionality of Detective into IntelliJ in a native way, meaning I could use the native dialogues, the native text fields and all of this. 
Um, I really don't want to do this because working with IntelliJ and building plugins for it is kind of cumbersome. So um, I, I kind of shy away from touching too much IntelliJ code because it's it was really hard getting all of that to work just because all of the configurations, all of the different things to watch out for. So those essentially would be the two ways to do this. Um, obviously the same goes for VS Code. Um, but right now I feel like I have a good enough balance between integration and detective. So right now you can launch detective with just a single click. You don't have to type detective in a command line anymore. So for me, at least that kind of helps a lot. And I personally don't think I would gain a lot by having it inside the application too. Also, especially because I have two monitors and I do have a lot of screen real estate for detective to, to just sit there. So, um, but how, how did you, how do you actually launch, uh, detective from IntelliJ or is that kind of a secret? Oh no, it's not a secret. Um, so let me, um, try to recall it. So basically it's, it's been a source for, for a lot of bugs to launch. So all the bugs, all the versions I posted before actually going live with were basically fixing detective, not properly launching on different platforms. Um, but basically what I'm doing is if you have detective inside your path, all you have to do to launch detective is type detective in a command line. So that's the same thing IntelliJ does. It opens an internal command line and just types detective and opens it. But then again, some people don't have the pub cache, whatever folder inside the path. So for them, you'd want to launch detective by running pub global run detective. So it basically internally just tries, okay, it's the path. Can I launch it using detective? Okay, I can't. Okay, can I launch it using Dart? Okay, maybe I can't because people can also install it using Flutter. So people can also install it using Flutter Pub Global Activate Detective. So then it tries, okay, can I launch it that way? If all those three things fail. It basically just says an error, okay, it seems like it isn't installed. If one of them succeeds, it saves. Okay, I know. I know the command to launch Detective from now. Um, yeah, there's a couple of uh, subtle differences on Windows and Mac, for example. Um, that's all <laughs> was a funny bug. Basically, if you launch an application on Mac, the thing you launch is basically an application from Mac OS, which launches your application, like the app file, meaning it closes immediately. So the process terminates, terminates and detective is open. That's cool. On Windows though, it launches detective directly. So the process doesn't terminate. So I had a bug where on macOS, everything was fine, but on Windows, once you open Detective, IntelliJ froze because it was still uh, awaiting termination of the process, which never did. It was an easy fix. I put it in a different thread, but bugs like these were plentiful. Yeah, I think that's so much for right, right once, run anywhere, right? Yeah. I think maybe Flutter's a little bit nicer, but at the same time, of course, there's going to be similar issues. Um, yeah, so... The cool thing was I had zero bugs with anything inside of Flutter. So anything that was written in Flutter was completely, like, not completely bug-free, but it didn't matter on which platform it was running. But anything related to launching Detective to the plugin, that was where the platform-specific bugs were. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Okay. All right. So what was, like, the first thing that you did? So... So, all right, let's let's kind of step back a little bit. When you had your ideas, when you're walking around, uh, like was actually detective like what it is now or what it was at the at when you started creating it? Was it actually the idea that you had, or were you just like, hmm, I just wonder what I can do with it, and then I'm just gonna try some stuff and see if it's possible, and then boom, the idea came, or what was the, what actually happened? Yeah, kind of. So it was this package. I knew it was powerful in a way that it allowed you to do stuff that really wasn't possible before. And that was like the idea from the beginning. I want to just build something that allows you to do something, which wasn't really possible before. And I wasn't 100% sure about what it's gonna be eventually. For me, it was always like this canvas, the starting point. Okay, now this is possible. And on top of this, we could build this, we could build this. Um, and I mean, that's kind of still what it is. It's still this tool that allows you to do stuff 
which currently has a couple of use cases, which I use myself um, from time to time. But I still feel like there could be things built on top of it, which um, would be made possible with this. So I was also thinking about kind of re-architecting detective where like all the core logic is inside a package, which you could, for example, interact using a command line and detective uh, UI only interacts with like the command line, which would in theory allow third party apps, packages or other things to kind of use detective to add more functionality, debugging support and our capabilities to their packages. Um, it would be a bigger refactor and I would have to do quite a bit of work to, to um, get it working. But it's just like these ideas which I um, think about from time to time. And if there's something that just feels cool and I talk to a couple of people and they say, yeah, that's cool, then I'm just going to build it. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine there could be some really interesting stuff you can do. I really just kind of want to play around with this VM services. Because when you walk me through everything, I, I am interested about how all this kind of stuff kind of works. So it seems like it's using JSON RPC over a WebSocket. Um, so you actually, it's not really like the VM services library. Does it actually offer you anything in particular? Or is it just like kind of abstracting this JSON RPC? Um, so the library has, I'd say, two main purposes. First off, the documentation is very, very good. So pretty much anything you need to know about the VM services is documented on this one huge page. And second, yeah, it basically um, abstracts like the JSON RPC away into type safe objects. It also takes care of like callbacks. Uh, so you don't have to worry about kind of registering callback handlers and all of that fun stuff. So it kind of gives you a nice and clean API to, to work with. And yeah, it's, it's like really powerful. So for example, there's a method which gives you all class references for a given name, if I remember correctly, which I use to like display the, the class inside your isolate. And from there on, you can receive an ID to a class handle using that ID. You can list all the instances, which I do. And for these instances, you can receive the ID. And using that ID, you can evaluate that instance. And if you evaluate an instance, you receive all the fields, you receive all the methods, you receive pretty much anything you need to know about that instance. And you can store it ID. Um, okay, you cannot really store it ID. That's an implementation detail because that ID is being um, reused eventually. But you can kind of keep a reference to that. And um, then just, just evaluate that object. There's a lot of different things you can do. Like you can do evaluation, you can hook into performance metrics, you can do all sorts of breakpoints, you can stop the program, you can uh you can do you can do a lot of things. And um, it's like it's not really interesting to somebody building a Flutter app per se, but it's really interesting for some somebody um trying to enhance the the experience of building apps. Um yeah, so, so another thing um, I could be talking and telling you about a bit is this thing I experimented with um, a lot, which I never implemented into Detective because the use case I wanted to implement um, just doesn't work like on a very fundamental level. And the topic is kernel transformers. So this is actually a thing I've been playing around with, I think two years ago too. Uh, when I was working on uh, my widget maker, which is this um, UI builder, which I was um, working on at the time. Um, and basically what I wanted to do is, first off, kernel is like this intermediate program structure, which is being compiled to first. So the compiler takes your source code, which is just plain text. It does all its things and it produces kernel, which is kind of this, half binary, half plain text thingy, which is um, pre-processed and can be further compiled to like native instructions. It can be interpreted. It can, there's a bunch of stuff you can do with it. And there's one step in particular, which is called tr the kernel transformer, um, which can take one kernel file, which is basically in its abstract syntax tree structure. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the abstract syntax tree is like the structure of your program in a fundamental level. So 
for example, if you have an addition, the, the tree for that addition would be you have the parent as the addition operation and both the children would be the left and right operand. So your whole program can be expressed as like this one giant tree and that's essentially what it is. So there's this program which allows you to take this one tree, do operations on that tree and produce a new tree. So it basically transforms your program to something else. Currently, there's one very prominent way, like there's multiple, but this is a very interesting way that's being used. Um, if you're inside the inspector and you see a widget in, in the tree, you can tap on the widget and it actually takes you to the line of code where you declare this widget. So if you think about it, that shouldn't be possible because inside the program, it has no idea where the, pro the, the widget is instantiated from. It's just there. It has no idea. So this is possible because there's this current transformer, which before running the app transforms the, the abstract syntax tree and just takes a look for every instantiation. It um, basically looks at what line and, and what file it's being declared and adds that to a, fi a private field inside the widget. So you can see this if you, for example, set a breakpoint and you see a widget, it has this, I don't know what the, um, I think it's called location, underscore location. And you will see there's a field underscore location, which points to the file and line of that widget. And it's inside your own object without you ever having to declare it. Because in this compilation step, step it's using the current transformer to add that. And this then allows you to just tap on a widget. It knows it can use this private local field and it can navigate to where it is. You can even disable this uh, current transformer step if you add, I think, dash dash um, uh, widget location or something like this. You can disable and enable it. It's enabled by default. Um, so I was experimenting. Could one use this current transformer to make debugging for apps easier? So the thing I was trying to implement is detective supports editing state. So if you have a non-final field, you can just tap on a field and type a new value into the field. The huge issue inside of Flutter is that in most architectures, pretty much every field is final. Every interesting field is final because you have your immutable object. And if you want to change anything, you have to copy the whole object, which isn't really fun to do, uh, in, like in this debugger. So I was thinking, could one use this current transformer to just delete every final like every final keyword, so to say. So everything inside your application is not final, just in the super, super debug mode. Um, turns out you can, it actually worked. I was able to change final fields, even though they shouldn't be changeable. There was one issue which made it all crumble. Um, there's this little keyword named const. <laughs> and if you use const, everything inside your object needs to be final. So if you remove final, const, gives you, okay, this can't be const. And here's the deal, you can't really remove const because that's more deeply involved because constant uh, expressions are also evaluated using in the compile time. So if you use a const, it is not being re-instantiated during runtime, obviously, because it's constant. During compile time, it's instantiated once and in the runtime, it's being just reused the same object. So you cannot really remove const, therefore you cannot remove final. And most people that make immutable objects use the const keyword. And thus, I wasn't able to remove the finals. If you remove the const yourself, I was able to clean everything and there was no finals. But obviously, if it works in some cases, it might as well not work at all. So um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to achieve that. Um, but I still think there could be a couple of use cases where this could be useful. For example, um, one thing that uh, is annoying sometimes is in, even in detective, you can only observe class and their fields. But what if you want to observe um, local variables inside functions? You cannot really do that because scopes come and go. They're not really say, uh, tied to an object. So what could possibly be done um, is using a kernel transformer I could kind of transform the function you want to debug into another function, which adds a lot more debugging capabilities. Basically, you can imagine this program adding debugging statements like prints and anything inside your function after every single statement. So it kind of 
not time travel, but see what the function is doing after every single statement. Stuff like this um, should totally be possible using the current transformers. Um, I haven't uh, continued experimenting with these as also setting this up also involves patching the third tool itself. So you have to overwrite a couple of files to add it to the pipeline. And unfortunately, current transformers are not planned to be like supported for third party developers right now or ever. Um, so maybe in the future, I will explore this more. And certainly like this gives you all the power you would ever need. Like detective and the VM service gives you a lot of power about the app, but these current transformers give you like the ultimate power to do whatever you want in terms of debugging. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Because those are really, really short lived variables if they're initiated within a function. Yeah. So what would be, it would be cool to take a look at that, but then you're basically building a debugger, right? Where, I mean, you could just have a break point over there and then just step, 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 step. Of course you could. The issue I see with that is how often does it happen that you step over something and you're like, damn, I need to go back, but it's not possible. Yeah. So, so the idea could kind of be, um, you could just see it all, all at once. You wouldn't have to worry about going back going forward, it's it's just, you, you see the information. And again, um, timing can be can be important inside functions and can be very hard to distinguish using debugger or it's called before, is this like, um, yeah, how, how is the timeline of all of this? When is this being called? Where is being called from, I guess? Like there's, I feel like sometimes there's just things that, or even there might be a bug in a function and you don't even know to look at the function. So you just want to print everything that's going on in this class. So you, you would be able to kind of just catch this by seeing, okay, there seems to be something wrong without having to know, okay, it's in this function. I mean, these are all just ideas I had, and in the end, they might be completely pointless and could be completely bad. Um, but I mean, I like just exploring, thinking about stuff like this, and eventually maybe finding something that is actually useful. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I definitely had the situation where we're walking through and then things are not quite working and yeah, you step over when you should step into. Mm -hmm. So it's happened too many times. I almost wish that detective actually would be somehow usable in a production standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's so many times where it's like everything works fine on your side, but then you give it to a client or, or they give it to their customers. And then you always have these random bugs. Like I have a really weird bug where, um, I would perform some action and it works as, as we agreed, but you know, he performs an action and it doesn't quite work. And so the question is like, what's going on? We are interacting with the outside service. So I'm wondering, you know, does he have this bad internet connection or why is it that he's having this issue? Mm -hmm. Um, and also I wish that I could get more debugging information about general devices and, and like generally about devices because yeah, it's same clients like uh, you know, even though you have all all bars, all four bars or whatever for your four G, it's possible that you can actually have no internet connection mm -hmm. or it's very spotty. That's true. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how to explain to the guy. <laughs> so it'd be nice if we could have some kind of way to get that, but I don't know if you can even get that from a device in general. So regarding the like kind of remote debugging. In theory, it is possible as long as the build you're sharing is debug this debug build because um, obviously, like the VM service is just not included in release builds, and you wouldn't want it. Like you don't want to have an open server listening to commands to evaluate freeform code <laughs> inside their apps on millions of devices. So, um, but if you like have a debug version and you share it to somebody and the person opens it, um, and you somehow get access to like the local um, web socket and like you're obviously in the same network and firewall and all of that is um, set up accordingly. You should be able to, to establish a connection between the two. I'm not quite sure how you'd figure out the, the port and like the, the web socket connection URL. Um, but in theory that, that could be possible. Yeah, I did see that you can set, I was looking at the um, VM service and they have a test case because they have an example and I saw that there's a dash dash enable VM service equals, and then you can put a port number there. 
Mm -hmm. So that could possibly work. I mean, it would be nice, like, because I do have for that that one, there's actually, like, well, what I've been thinking for a while is, like, having, um, so so every client can actually connect with a WebSocket, and obviously you can push events to WebSockets uh, to these clients. So actually pushing debug, like, actually asking, asking debug questions, that should be possible. Of course, you have to manually create all those things, but... Um, I still think that's could be useful. Right? Yeah, that would so be interesting. Good. But you don't get all the information that, that you have, right? Where it's like, okay, tell me all the instances of this block. <laughs> and let me know all the information about that. Right? You said that that's just not possible in release. I mean, it is possible, but you'd have to implement it yourself, obviously. So you would have to write a function which iterates over every single field, over like all of this. Um, and it's certainly doable using code generation too. So you could, in theory, if you wanted to write like a code generator, which exposes a function for you, which says like dump all user state, which just dumps all the state, every single field, every single whatever you have inside your application into like, for example, a file where which the user can share to the devs. Um, so that's certainly possible. Hmm. You can do this in, in release mode, you're saying? Or this is only for development? Of course, you could do it in release mode because using the code generation, the code to, to, to access like the fields. So you cannot access something you cannot name. So if you mm. cannot name it, obviously you cannot access it. How would you access it? Um, but because you already named it inside your code, you can, okay, print user.name. You can just do that inside the production code too. Obviously, you can access the name variable. And using code generation, you could automate that. Like in the code generator, you have access to the abstract syntax tree. You could list all the fields inside the class. That's what all the code generators for JSON serialization are doing anyways. Um, so you could just run uh, iterate over every single field. Um, if it's an object, you could then al also iterate over every subfield and just just dump it. Mm. Okay, maybe so. Maybe my idea could be possible there. Certainly, because that would be nice. Because yeah, like I said, too many too many weird issues. That's true. That you have. On the other hand, it's kind of hard because you see all the user data, but you obviously there's only so much data you can get. So for every mm -hmm. piece of data you want, you would have to explicitly kind of program it into or have your generator generated. But there are so many things that could be wrong. Like for example, payment could be broken because the user has a phone without Google accounts. Internet may be broken. Um, the camera may be defect on the device. Um, there's so many things that could essentially be wrong that you would never have the full picture. If you really wanted the full picture, you would not only have to copy every single bit of memory on the device, you would also have like the whole device because the camera might be broken, the some sort of internal components might be broken. Um, even like there is sometimes bug, uh, bugs. I recently saw a video and heard about this before too. Cosmic rays could bit flip an important bit inside your application and cause a bug this way. So there's just so much that could go wrong that you would never really get a full picture you would only ever get an approximation of what it might be on the actual device. It's kind of funny that you mentioned about the device stuff, right? So one of my clients, they use uh, Apple Health HealthKit or Health, mm -hmm. Apple Health, basically. And it seems like all of the App Store testers are using iPads for some odd reason. I don't know why, but... Um, but Health is just not available on iPad. And these are the iPads that they test with. So like one of the first times we had somebody testing, like it just crashed because when you try to read health data from an iPad, which doesn't have the ability, it just crashes. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's a good point, right? Something like that is, is definitely interesting to see. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, that's what current um, crash reporting tools do. They They know they will never get a full picture of everything, but Having a stack trace is like a very good approximation because you know something went wrong and you probably have a lot of relevant informa information re uh, related to, to the error. So, so stack trace is really valuable because 
it's not a lot of information, but it is probably information that is important and crucial. Whereas if you dump everything, most of the information is just going to be useless because yeah, the onboarding is great, login work great. Um, I don't care about that. I really care about this one thing. Yeah, I would say most of the time I just care about certain thing because yeah, there's this one thing that always messes up for some reason, and it's very annoying. So yeah, but I, I think it just would be easier to just create a custom routine that listens for a certain message or something. Yeah. Anyways, enough of you, enough of me complaining about my issues to you, but <laughs> yeah, of course your your app definitely inspires me to think about how can I better debug something, especially remotely. It's always a tricky part. Um, yeah, uh, I think we're slightly over our time, but uh, that's totally fine because yeah, we can spend more time on this. Um, is there anything else you want to talk more about Detective or something else you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I think uh, we talked about a bunch of things, covered a couple of questions you had to. Um, for the sake of time, I think, um, yeah, I think we, we talked about pretty much everything there is regarding the Detective. Um, there's questions. Um, feel free to ask me via email, via Twitter. Um, uh, the, the like Twitter and all of that will probably link in the show notes. Um, if not, just um, search for my name and you will probably find them somewhere. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I had something else I wanted to talk about, but I totally forgot what it was. But we do. I do have a couple of questions I'd like to ask everybody. I think you might have seen that at the at the end of the question sheet, which was uh, you know finding uh, maybe I can actually slightly t- tweak this question, which is about the state of education in Flutter, right? Finding this kind of inf- information you did about the VM services, do you think that this kind of really deep dive stuff is actually really easily available to everybody if they really want to learn? Or do you need to like, yeah, I don't know, make friends with somebody in the Dart team? Um, so to be honest, um, I feel like it is not very easy to find, but the reason for this is because nobody really needs it. Expect, except for me, for example, except for somebody um, crazy enough to build uh, these dev toolings. So um, it's not like promoted and on a front page of everywhere, but if you're searching for it, you can certainly find it. And Flutter really is one of those frameworks. And I didn't, there, there aren't too many. Um, okay, but a lot of modern frameworks have quite a good documentation, but I feel like especially Flutter um, compared to like the Java world where I came from before, has outstanding documentation. So in Flutter and in Dart, you can always go to the package you're using into the source code um, because you cannot like pre-compile the source code and have a dependency to it, um, which you can have in Java. And I feel like that's like a huge issue. Um, it, it makes sense from a business perspective, but dev- developer experience is so degraded because, okay, don't know how to use this library, the documentation is not good enough, you cannot go to the source code to take a look what's going on. I mean, you can, you can decompile it, but good luck scanning through variables called X, Y, and Z. Um, Whereas in Flutter and Dart, you can always take a look at the packages you're using, and more often than not, they're very well documented. Um, And especially like the VM service, if you're really interested for this, there is a lot of resources in terms of documentation, which explains stuff like this. Um, and I mean, you don't really have to like be friends with somebody working on the VM service team, but even if you um, have questions, there are a lot of, um, possible ways to ask, like maybe stack overflow, one of the Slack channels, there's discord, uh, channel where you can talk to people. And I think there's also a Google group where it's specifically about the Dart analyzer. Um, where you can ask questions and you get responses about like the weirdest topic nobody ever could help you on Stack Overflow, for example. Um, so I really feel like it is really possible to take a look at these things. It's it's really not like magic. Um, I didn't have to study the dark arts to to know all of this. All I did is uh, read some documentation, experiment a bit. Um, so I feel like yeah, the documentation is great for a lot of things. And it certainly is very friendly com- in comparison to other things. Obviously, it's it's something deeper. If you have no idea what like all of this meta thing is, you have no idea what a debugger is. Obviously, you're gonna have a hard time understanding what this is. But um, coming from like a reasonable experience to be using something like this, 
I I think it's 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 perfectly documented and accessible. Yeah, I I honestly your detective thing has kind of inspired me to actually play more with the uh, VM services and maybe nice. build something similar. I I I don't really like the all the UI that you have, but I think I understand why you do it like that because you want to be able to kind of lay out your stuff in your own way. And having a canvas drag and drop is, makes a lot of sense. For me, I'm thinking more of a tabular thing where you, you click on a tree view and it opens up from there. Um, but yeah, maybe, maybe I will make something like that just for fun and sure. yeah, maybe share it with you. Cause, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, if you're, <laughs> you basically inspired me, so I should probably give back something. Maybe it'd be nice to have. I don't know. The more there is, the better it is for a community. So if you have something that also helps with debugging and it's kind of, uh, scratches an itch that hasn't been scratched before go for it um i'm happy to to like help you with stuff if uh stuff is is um kind of i don't know hard there's a couple of things to watch out for um but yeah so uh another question is like um with flutter 2.0 right do you feel like that really brought something more to the table or was it more like a facelift than anything else um to be honest, I don't feel like Flutter really needs right now these. I mean, yeah, it's 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 kind of it's this thing to to um, push Flutter even further. But I feel like there's not like these huge improvements in like just the version. The improvements are very steady, so you don't currently. I feel like really need like a major upgrade to 3.0 for by now because. You can do those uh, increasements because Flutter is always evolving from day to day. Um, so um, I feel like 2.0 in itself wasn't really huge in that moment because everything leading up to it was already constantly landing on the newest branches. So I just feel like the constant improvement is great um, with Flutter. Um, it's, it's not like they are building something in secret. I mean, sometimes they do. Um, web was a big surprise, <laughs> um, but it's it's a lot of um, incremental improvement, which it's it's hard to version stuff like this. It's yeah. Uh, what about your how you write your own Flutter apps? Do you use what state management system do you use? Um, nowadays, I really like to use combination of Riverpod and State Notifier. Um, I kind of uh, try to use less of block just a bit because essentially it's the same, but different. And I think Remy talked about this quite a bit, but streams can be quite awkward to use as like state management, just because streams essentially um, were made for something different. The, the streams really shine in worlds where parallel computing data streams um, are really prominent, where you can have streams and multi-thread them, for example, in the Java Kotlin world. Um, you can have data transformations and all of this, but it can be quite awkward to use in Flutter for state management just because the asynchronous nature of streams. So one prominent example, um, I'm not talking about block now, I'm just talking about streams. If you have a pure stream, and you want to listen to it using a stream builder and build UI um, accordance to that, you miss the first frame just because the stream is asynchronous. So you may be thinking, okay, one frame isn't too much, but one frame is actually a lot. Um, the reason for this is one frame is noticeable. And if you have one frame of a white, like a one white frame and like your page, users notice. And even worse, if you have a page transition and you're using heroes, it will fail because the first frame is where it is looking for heroes. It's not finding any heroes. So it says, okay, cannot use the hero transition here. And I feel like there's a lot of issues with streams, especially also not being able to access the current value. What if, let's say, I have a stream where a username is saved. And yep, that works great. I can show you username in the UI. Um, but now I want to access the current username for whatever reasons. It's not possible. So for that, you would be using something like Rx. You would be using something like Block. What they do is they use streams and save the latest value. And yeah, streams feel weird at times, especially also error handling in streams, like the error callbacks. Sometimes, I, I, I even don't know why it happens, but sometimes errors get 
get like they are catapulted into the third dimension uh, into another dimension because the error is kind of like there's an error handle missing or some something is just not working and I had a lot of times where something wasn't working. I had no idea why. I had no stack trace. And it turned out, yeah, the stream was kind of not handling the error and just, um, yeah, just throwing it away. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I never thought about that. Um, I was always kind of a big proponent of using streams because, yeah, with data, that it's always changing, right? And uh, it's, yeah, I tend to think about streams as like futures, but that just keep keep updating as opposed to a future just does something once. I mean, I really, I really dig the, the, um, the concept of streams and the, the concept of like river pod and stay notifier and all of, uh, these things is exactly the same as streams. All there is different to it is the implementation. Um, instead of having like the stream original contract, which is pretty like, it's not really made for UI. If you take a specifically look at the contract, um, also if you're like coming from Android and you know about back pressure, code observables, hot observables, all of this, it not, doesn't really feel like it is made for UI. It's more made for asynchronous scheduling. Like, um, I don't know what's, what it's called in English, but the, the issue where you have messages, message queues, yeah, message queues and stuff like this. That's where streams really shine because, um, like back pressure and all of this is really useful if you have streams and you have one operation, which is slower than the producer, like the, the, um, receiver is slower than the producer. So what do you do? You cannot receive that much as the producer can produce. So you kind of need to throttle the stream and stuff like this. And this is really complicated. And it's essentially the th same thing I was talking at the beginning. Building something narrow for something very narrow is kind of easy because you can focus on what you want to achieve. But building something that's very general and works for everything is super hard. And that, that's where a lot of complexity lies. And I feel like the complexity in streams is because of this streams are meant to also be used or mainly be used for like these complicated data processing um, streams essentially. And that's where the complexity kind of also um, then is in state management, which doesn't really have to be. I mean, with, with libraries such as Block and Qubit, obviously they did a lot to make it easier and kind of yeah, hide streams from you, like uh, allow you to use streams without really using streams. Um, but in the end, like I also feel like all the state management things are, it's all the same thing, just with different names. Yeah, for the, for the most part, yeah, I started to see that. I was comparing MobX to the block and I thought block was just, this is simpler way of MobX to a certain extent. Um, but uh, maybe the final question, which, I wanted to ask is like, do you have any tips for beginners or any kind of warnings for beginners that, you know, like when they're getting started in their flutter journey? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, this may sound weird, but I'd say make mistakes. Um, it's very important to make mistakes because without mistakes, it's hard to learn. And it's, it's completely different if somebody tells you what to do versus you knowing you should or should not do this based on an experience because you remember you did this once and it was terrible. Um, so yeah, just making lots of mistakes um, in a, the, the least time possible, just doing projects, um, not really ha not really clinging to the code because at some point it will probably be rewritten. Um, I don't even want to know how much bad code I, s I wrote and still write. So I mean, doesn't matter how good you are, you still learn, you still make mistakes. I may have really good expertise in one area of app development, but maybe if I want to implement, I don't know, some other area like SQL storage or something like this, maybe my concept of how I would be doing this is completely bad and I had to like rewrite it because um, I did it, it didn't work out and was bad, I made mistakes, but for the next time I know better. Um, so yeah, just, just making mistakes, talking to people, always being critical of one's code. Um, and like not trusting just somebody 100%. Okay. They 100% know what they are doing. Just always taking everything with a grain of salt, trying it out and kind of, um, yeah, seeing what works for you 
um, also doing lots of refactoring, always trying to improve. I think the an easy way to kind of sum up what you're saying is basically fail fast. <laughs> yes. And also don't trust anybody. Nobody knows what anything, nobody knows what they're doing, <laughs> which is, um, obviously you, you, you trust people, but I, I'd say have strong opinions and hold them loosely in a way that, um, the thing you are doing, defend it, talk to people, say, okay, I'm doing this way. I think this is good. But if somebody proves you or gives you something better and it seems better and it looks better and it is better then don't hang or don't cling to your own implementation just because you did it yourself. Um, if something else is better um, and you know it, use that, do that. The most annoying part is when, is when both solutions are good and you don't know which one is uh, the better way to go. Yeah, that's, I mean, at some point you just have to take chances, just take whatever feels better or if it's, if it's equally good, just, just flip a coin. And if it doesn't work out at the end, you know, the other was probably better and use that. <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay. Is there anything else you wanted to, to say or kind of, you know, shout out to before we sign off? Um, um, I mean, check out Detective. It's uh, detective.dev. Um, if you have any questions, if you like it, if you don't like it, let me know. Um, yeah. I mean, you can also follow me on Twitter, obviously. Uh, it should be in the show notes. It's um, Norbert uh, Kozia, K-O-Z-S-I-R. And if there's anything you want to talk about, ask questions, uh, give feedback, whatever, my DMs are open, just just hit me up. Yep, that's actually how we, we, we actually talk to each other, right? I think I've sent you a message over Twitter, so everybody yeah. opens up the DMs, so I'm happy that you did. Okay, so then if nothing else, um, great having you on. Maybe we should have you on after some more updates to the tool or if you have anything else or sure. the thing that you're finally working on finally goes out. It's also something that we can, we can bring on here and see if it's useful to people. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.